Um, our final speaker for this session is Dr. Andrew Finley from the Washington University in St. Louis. His talk is titled Therapeutic Approaches for Dominantly Inherited LGMDs. Hey everyone, my name is Andrew Pillay. I'm part of the junior faculty in the neurosurgical division at WashU in St. Louis. I'd like to thank the organizers for the very kind invitation to give a talk. Um, so I'd also like to apologize for not being able to be there in person. If anyone has questions, please feel free to reach out to me via email. Um, so we're going to be talking about a variety of different therapeutic approaches for dominantly inherited limb girdles. Here are my disclosures. So first, some basics on dominantly inherited limb girdle muscular dystrophy. The dominance refers to the inheritance pattern for this set of disorders. And so for non-sex chromosomes, everyone has two sets of genes. And for a recessive disorder, you have to have two bad copies of a gene in order to cause disease. Whereas dominant disorders, it only requires one. I mean, this means that an affected individual is going to have a 50% chance of passing on the bad gene to their children and causing disease. Some rough generalizations can be made about the dominant limb girdles. They occur less frequently, about 10 to 15% of all limb girdles. Um, they have lower CK levels compared to recessive forms. And they're more often adult onset disorders, and their weakness progresses more slowly over time compared to the recessive forms. And because affected individuals usually are in good health at reproductive age, this commonly results in these extensive family trees with many affected individuals and the disease gets passed down from generation to generation. So this is an example of a family with limb girdle muscular dystrophy type D1, um, where those individuals who are affected are shaded dark. And here's a table summarizing the different dominantly inherited limb girdles using the old and the new nomenclature. So in the prior nomenclature, dominantly inherited subtypes were indicated by a one, followed by a letter based on their order of discovery. Um, with the new nomenclature, dominant inheritance is indicated by a D followed by a number. So in this case, LGMD D1. You can see that some of the limb girdles that were part of the old nomenclature are no longer classified as limb girdles. And these recategorized re disorders can absolutely cause weakness in a limb girdle pattern, uh, but their primary clinical manifestations are, are most commonly something different. So for example, they cause distal predominant weakness that might affect the hands and feet more so. For the current classification system, dominant limb girdles can be due to mutations in the genes DNAJV6, TNPO3, HNR and PDL, calpane 3 which can also cause recessive limb girdle, and then the collagen 6A genes. So to understand how to best treat hereditary disorders of muscle, such as limb girdle muscular dystrophy, it's important to first understand the basic hereditary mechanisms underpinning the disease. So starting out with recessive disorders, these require both copies of a gene to be faulty. I um, mean, having just one bad copy of a gene results in someone being a queer, um, but not actually having the disease. Uh, recessively inherited limb girls are fairly similar in their disease mechanisms. They're either due to mutations that result in absence of the protein or uh, loss of function of the protein. In contrast, dominantly inherited disorders are caused by at least three different molecular mechanisms. And these mechanistic categories are oversimplifications, but they provide a helpful framework for how to think about dominant disease mechanisms. So the first one is haploinsufficiency, and this refers to disorders where mutations cause only half of the amount of a functional protein to be produced. And this amount of protein is insufficient for normal cellular function. The next one, it's a toxic or gain of function mechanism, and this results from mutations that either increase the protein's activity, prolong its stability, and thereby increase its effect in the cell, or cause the protein or RNA to gain some additional toxic function unrelated to its given role. And then lastly is a dominant negative mechanism, and this results from mutations that negate the activity of the functioning protein. And so this mechanism is often seen with proteins that grouped together to form a complex of proteins. And each protein complex that the mutant protein, or the orange protein in this case, um, as part of is rendered non-functional. There are several categories of gene-based treatment strategies, but the strategy that's optimally suited to treat a specific disease largely depends 
um, on the disorders mechanistic category. So for all recessively inherited disorders, gene replacement therapy, where a new functioning copy of the gene is provided, will in theory be helpful. This approach typically utilizes an adeno-associated virus to deliver a functional version of the gene to a person's cells. Uh, gene therapy can also be helpful in the case of dominant haploinsufficiency disorders where mutations cause only half of the amount of functional protein to be produced. In contrast, knockdown strategies are ideally suited for treating dominantly inherited disorders that are caused by a toxic or gain of function or a dominant negative mechanism. And, and that being said, um, no therapies or therapeutic clinical trials exist for any of the dominant limb girls at this point in time. There are several preclinical studies that have been completed investigating treatments in cells and animal models. Um, so there's a, a variety of different knockdown approaches and which is most well suited for a disease really depends on how much of the protein is required for a cell to function normally. So if complete absence of a protein is tolerated, a knockdown approach that targets both copies of a gene or a non-allele specific approach could be beneficial for a dominantly inherited disorder. An example of this is limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 1A, which was reclassified as it more commonly causes a distal myopathy with myofibular pathology. Um, it's an example of a muscle disease with a likely toxic gain-of-function mechanism caused by mutations in the structural Z-disc protein myotelin. It causes it to misfold and become insoluble and aggregate within muscle. Interestingly, absence of myotelin doesn't appear to cause abnormalities in mouse skeletal muscle, and so this argues against the dominant negative or haploinsufficiency mechanism. And then there's a, a mouse model of LGMD1A that was created by um, overexpressing mutant human myotelin, and this leads to aggregates of myotelin with mid muscle as well as weakness in the mice. Then as a potential therapeutic strategy, Dr. Scott Harper's group at Nationwide Children's Hospital used adeno-associated virus to deliver a microRNA that targets myotillin to knock it down. And this significantly reduced the amount of uh, myotillin levels, it improved muscle pathology, it reduced protein aggregates, and also improved strength in these mice. However, if at least 50% of protein levels are required for cellular health, a knockdown treatment that selectively targets the mutant gene or a allele-specific knockdown could be used. So for example, LGMD D5, this is also known as Bethlehem myopathy, is caused by dominant negative mutations in the collagen 6 genes. Collagen 6 is a key component of the extracellular matrix that surrounds muscle fibers. And these dominant negative mutations disrupt the multimerization of collagen subunits and prevents the formation of these collagen 6 microfibrils. Uh, absence of collagen 6 is also not tolerated, and this is evidenced by recessive loss of function mutations causing the more severe Ulrich's congenital muscular dystrophy. And then selective knockdown of just the mutant allele is an ideal treatment strategy for these dominant collagen 6 related dystrophies as it avoids the potential damaging effects of complete knockdown. This approach has been achieved using a variety of different chemistries, including silencing, silencing RNA or siRNA, as well as CRISPR-Cas9, uh, to selectively target the mutant collagen 6 in primary fibroblast cultures from patients. And it was found to improve their collagen 6 extracellular matrix following allele-specific knockdown. Preclinical studies in LGMD D1 provide a related but slightly different therapeutic example involving an isoform specific knockdown approach instead of an allele specific approach. So LGMD D1 is due to dominantly inherited point mutations in a gene called DNA JB6. This is a chaperone protein. It plays an important role in protein homeostasis by maintaining proteins in their uh, proper shape and preventing them from aggregating. Uh, mutations in DNA JB6 are does I have a dominant effect via toxic gain of function or potentially a dominant negative mechanism. Then muscle biopsies from patients show vacuoles as well as these aggregates and myofibular pathology and this illustrates DNA JB6's importance in protein homeostasis within muscle. It has two different isoforms. So there's DNA JB6A, which is the larger isoform or a larger version of the protein and it's found mainly within muscle nuclei whereas there's DNA JB6B, the shorter version of the protein, or smaller isoform, and it's localized 
uh, to myofibular structures in muscle, specifically the Z disc, which is a, a structural component of muscle. And as shown by these little red asterisks, disease causing mutations reside within regions of DNA JV6 that are shared by both isoforms. There's several lines of evidence that indicate the B isoform is primarily responsible for disease pathogenesis. This is supported by the fact that the B isoform localizes to the key sites of pathology that we see in human biopsies. And one other important thing is that absence of DNA JB6 is embryonic lethal in mice. What we did instead of developing a global knockdown approach is we developed an approach to selectively knock down the B isoform in myotubes using morpholinos, which are a type of antisense oligonucleotide. What we found is that selectively reducing DNA JB6 B levels in LGMD D1 mouse myotubes doing this for six days, it resulted in the normalization of some of their disease-related abnormalities, specifically a proteomic signature, which is a set of proteins whose abundances were altered by DNA JB6 mutations. So these studies were recently completed and haven't been tested in mice yet. Another treatment approach involves complete knockdown of a gene while simultaneously providing a replacement copy of that gene that's resistant to knockdown. This the strategy uses an adeno-associated virus to deliver the necessary genetic cargo, and by delivering a replacement copy of the gene, it avoids the potentially damaging effects from knockdown, even if over 50% 50, 50 of the protein levels are required. And although it hasn't been tested in any dominant limb girdles, this approach has been found to be beneficial in, in mouse models of several other dominantly inherited neuromuscular disorders, uh, specifically oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. There are many remaining barriers to developing treatments for dominantly inherited limb girdles when compared to their recessive counterparts. And again, more research needs to be done to categorize the complex heterogeneous disease mechanisms for each dominant limb girdle. And this is a requirement before even being able to conceptualize a therapy. Additionally, the various knockdown approaches are not nearly as developed compared to the gene replacement therapies used for recessive limb girdles. These knockdown approaches require um, additional research, especially in the area of therapeutic delivery to muscle. And even if a promising therapy was suddenly available, the natural history of disease progression for dominantly inherited limb girdles really aren't all that well characterized yet. Uh, characterizing the natural history of disease progression is really important in order to identify ideal outcome measures for future therapeutic trials. Um, we started to do some research in this area by conducting a preliminary natural history study in LGMD D1. And so through this work, we found that different disease-causing mutations are associated with variable ages of onset. We also found that various mutations that cause disease are associated with different weakness patterns, where some people had uh, distal predominant weakness affecting their hands and feet, whereas others had a more typical limb girdle pattern of weakness. Now, we also found that certain mutations are associated with different rates of disease progression, where certain individuals progress much more quickly to using a wheelchair, whereas others progress much more slowly. And then overall, this variability in individuals with LGMD D1 really highlights the importance of connecting with and identifying as many individuals with dominantly inherited limb girdles as possible, as these future clinical trials are going to require really high rates of participation to combat not only this variability in disease severity, but also the rarity of these disorders. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. Thanks.